Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Matt, 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 Matthew Dickerson. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Hello, goal scorers, ribbon catchers, and podium finishers. It's time to step up and collect your winnings here at Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. In today's episode, we're cashing in with some big stories from the news from the future. We're checking out how law enforcement is reaching for the upper hand in crime fighting with a fleet of hovering eyes in the skies. We've got news about a massive development in battery technology and maybe, just maybe, we may have found the limit of AI. It's Achilles' heel exposed. Stay tuned for that one. But now, welcome to the microphone, the man with a fistful of details, it's Matthew Dickerson. What's been happening in your week, Matt? Well, I've had a really interesting week meeting with an airline executive, a CEO of an airline, a fairly large airline, and having a discussion about decarbonisation. Mm. And it was quite interesting to talk about the steps that they're taking to decarbonise because, as we all know, transport... Well, in particular, air transport, air transport is a big contributor. And not a clear view to the solution going forward. Mm. If you're in transport in taxis or Ubers, for example, you can see a clear path forward that where you'll be driving an electric vehicle. If you've got trucks, long haul trucks, for example, we think hydrogen is probably the solution yeah, yeah. there. So we can see a path forward there. Yeah, but flight, we just don't have any answers yet. Not yet. So I was interested. I said, what are we looking at in 20 years? In 20 years time, when we're sitting around having a discussion about the power that you use to keep those planes up in the air, what's it going to be? And the answer was a couple of parts to it. One was the short haul flights, pretty much it's going to be battery, some form of battery, some form of electric flight. And we've talked about that and and we've said generally. That's interesting that they've actually, yeah, that's, that's coming out in the conversation in the industry. Exactly right. And we talk about it maybe, say, 500 kilometres or less, maybe around that distance, maybe a little bit more than that. We think, and we've discussed it on our podcast previously, that that seems to be where we'll see those short-haul flights. Yeah, you've got about an hour of flight or so. That seems to be, with current technology, that seems to be where they're aiming. And there's lots of domestic flights like that where you've got those short hops where it's just city to city, might be multiple flights a day, seems like it makes sense. But this particular executive said when you start talking about Sydney, LA, or basically long-haul international flights, sustainable aviation fuel, SAF, seems to be where they think they'll be headed with those. Now, SAF... Yeah, what's in SAF? Yeah, SAF is basically taking anything they can get that's renewable, that's not fossil fuel, (laughs) and then using existing hardware... To burn that. So, so we're talking about like biofuels. Okay. Yeah, something yeah. like that. So non-food crops, cooking oil, although you're going to need a lot of cooking oil, aren't you? So <laughs> just eat more chips, folks, so you can actually fly. Uh, maybe even plant oil. So ways of producing something that you can burn that's being produced with some form of renewable process rather than digging up oil out of the ground. Yeah, so so what we're talking about is carbon that's been put back into the atmosphere there. It's just carbon that's part of the carbon cycle anyway. Yeah. And that it's just just going through a cycle. It's not taking stuff that's been buried in the ground for millions of years and then exposing that back to the atmosphere. And uh, you're spot on. And I think the thing with that is that there are multiple different ways to come up with SAF. And I don't think the industry knows exactly what that will look like today. But I think the industry thinks, and especially... I suppose confirmed from this conversation I had, the industry seems to think, well, we're not quite sure what it'll look like and how it'll be produced, but we think those long-haul flights are going to need some form of SAF that we can burn. And the good part about it is the existing engines, not much in terms of modification, maybe a minor modification might be required, but typically they'll be able to run it in existing hardware with maybe some minor modifications. So in 20 years' time, again, the, the question was deliberately put 20 years down the path, what will happen. And I think the way that the airline industry will reduce their carbon footprint quite dramatically will be by lots of those short flights, not so much the long flights, but those long flights made with some SAF. I did ask a question about hydrogen because we've talked about some flights with hydrogen and is there a potential there? And again, at this point in time, and again, we just talked about one industry, but it seemed like that wasn't something that this particular executive thought was going to be the solution for yeah, the airline right. industry. 
and I'm being a bit unfair here because I'm asking a lot of one person who <laughs> has got the job of putting planes up in the air now and carrying passengers from yeah. A to B. So focused on the future, yes, obviously they do that, but whether they're focused on 20 years down the track but with... clearly a, they've got some clout and they're right in the thick of the industry. So the fact that they're thinking about it and it's mm. not just um, just not lip service, not, not ideas coming from outside saying, hey, you should try this, they're actually thinking about what's going to happen in 20 years' time there. Thinking about it, but the other thing that's interesting, they did, or this person did mention the fact that you'll probably see more of the small commuter flights, the ones that are relying on some form of quadcopter, some form of drone-type technology that we've talked about again when you've got people that are getting flights that go short distance, maybe even from the airport into the city, for example, when you land at an airport. But what was mentioned was the 2032 Olympics, which are being held, of course, in Brisbane. Yeah. They're already talking to some contractors or putting out some contracts for those maybe four, six-person wow. small drones, maybe autonomous, maybe someone in there piloting those. But as part of the solution to get around the city when the 2032 Olympics are on, yeah, wow. I think partly for convenience but also partly to show off, show off. Yeah, yeah, what's yeah. actually capable. Well, you've got a chance to do it. Why not? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So that's interesting. And, and things that we talk about, I suppose – Confirm for me that some of the conversations we've had are down the right path-ish because, again, we're, we are trying to predict the future on this Yeah, we're just speculating. And we're, right. You're talking about the things that are happening and mm. that are possibilities. Yeah. Um, yeah, and to think that, you know, some of these things are really, you know, starting to take a foothold. Yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, folks, let's tuck into today's stories. Now, I remember standing at the bus stop at Central Station on Broadway in Sydney in the early 90s, and I remember looking at the ground in astonishment at the vast carpet of cigarette butts on the ground. Absolutely disgraceful and disgusting. In that moment, it occurred to me that cigarette smoking was one thing, but the license to litter was something else. Now, cigarette butt litter has become much less of a thing in Australia 30 years later, but... Small, non-biodegradable litter is still a problem the world over, on our beaches, in our parks, across public thoroughfares, everywhere. If only there was some sort of robot that made a speciality out of collecting this annoyingly small but troublesome litter mat. If only there was some sort of robot. It almost seems like you've read ahead in the script here, James. (laughs) Sorry, I did some homework. (laughs) I don't have any details, though. You're going to tell us all about it. And it does seem fascinating, doesn't it? If you said to someone, here, take this scrap of paper, screw it up in a ball and just toss it on the ground, yeah. most people would say, oh, I'm not going to do that. That's littering. But those same people, you hand them a cigarette and say, smoke that, if they're a smoker. Yeah. And then what's left, they just flick it on the ground. It was a cultural thing. It is. So you finish with your cigarette butt and the cigarette butt goes on the ground, you stamp it out and the thing disappears, <laughs> supposedly. <laughs> Apparently, that's right. Now, we still have a problem across the world, and you are right, it's getting better than your example from well, 30 it's, years it's ago. It's still a problem when you travel overseas, um, particularly to maybe third world countries or developing countries, um, where smoking is still a really big thing. And maybe, I haven't been to Europe, but maybe someone could describe for us whether or not it's a big problem in Europe. But definitely, cigarette butts are still an issue. Well, I, I do find it when you travel overseas, it's frustrating because you'll sit in restaurants and someone beside you will light up a cigarette and you always turn to them and say, you can't do that. Oh, hold on. I'm in a different we're, country now. I don't really, your territory. That's right. I, I can't really get to say what you can and can't do in your country. So I think it is still a problem, but you're right. People just throw it on the ground, throw it out the car window, whatever. Out of sight, out of mind. And they think it's all okay. So the numbers are scary. About six trillion cigarettes are still smoked annually around the world. Mm. It seems like a lot. Sorry, did you say six trillion? Trillion. Yeah, that like I can't comprehend trillion. Trillion no, to be a number no, for me to it comprehend. Is, it's now gone beyond <laughs> comprehension. And Even when billion is almost a bit too much. It yeah. is, but when you break it down to the number of people in the world, there might be seven or eight billion people yeah. in the world. Then you go to trillion and you start thinking, wow, that's a lot of smokes per person. Yeah. So what are we? Average. We're about eight billion right now, people. So if you're it, saying that. Every day. No, they can't be no, smoking a thousand. The year. Not, oh, through the year, sorry. Yeah, through the year. So a thousand yeah, cigarettes right. roughly per person. Now, I smoke zero. You smoke yeah, zero. I smoke, so, so there's someone someone's else doing 3,000. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. <laughs> so there's still a lot, yeah. unfortunately. But of those, and I don't know who had the job of counting these. I just I don't envy <laughs> this. But four trillion of those Boy. six trillion are cigarette butts that are discarded. So we do yeah. have a huge problem across the world. Again, when you break it down, they're only small. 
Each cigarette butt has approximately 700 toxic chemicals, yeah. obviously very small amounts of those toxic chemicals, but they can get released into the environment, but they just look disgusting as well, don't they? So yeah. apologies for any smokers out there. I'm, I'm not the biggest fan. So researchers at the Italian Institute of Technology, and I understand why it might be from Italy, might be somewhere that <laughs> is smoking a little bit more than Australia, obviously. They've come up with Vero. Vero stands for Vacuum Cleaner. Equipped robot. Ignore the C bit in there, but <laughs> maybe it could just be vacuum equipped robot. So you did read it in the script. There is such a robot, and it focuses on literally going around and picking up cigarette butts only. That's all its job in life to do is. <laughs> it's four legged. So, yeah, I had a look at it. It looks like a puppy dog. It does look like, yeah. So the idea here is that. You don't want a robot on wheels because no. the environment you're going in can be up and down gutters, for example, yep. on the beach. Thick grass. All that sort of thing. So you can go with this and go around to these different areas where cigarette butts are discarded. And it's got a vacuum hose on the end and it literally walks around looking for, with cameras, looking for cigarette butts. That's a cigarette butt. I'll grab that. Scrap of paper. I'll ignore that. Now, you might think... Oh, so it only does cigarette butts? Only does cigarette butts. Okay. It's very specific on what it's got to do. And you might think, well, just clean up all the rubbish. But the idea with this is that it's only got a small storage capacity. Yeah. So you go along and you focus on that. If you start picking up packets of, of chips yeah. or different rubbish, just scraps of paper, whatever, you soon fill up your repository for all the cigarette butts. Whereas cigarette butts, yeah. you can go and do them. And I think the logic here is that the cigarette butt is going to do more damage in the environment than the scrap of paper or other rubbish that might be around out there. So this thing, I don't know if there's a big market for this, but someone's researched it, someone's built it, so maybe yeah, there yeah. is a bigger market than we realise, but it's got a 3D printed nozzle and it basically allows that to just go along and suck up various cigarette butts, keep them in the repository, take them back to a central point presumably, empty them out and away they go again. So if you're kicking back on a beach in Naples and this little puppy dog looking robot's walking past you and you're hearing funny noises like zzzt, zzzt, it's um, just this thing. What was that? Was that the noise of it walking or was that no, the no, noise no, of it? No, 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 no. That, that's, <laughs> that the, the, that's the sound of a vacuum cleaner. I thought it would be more instant. I thought it would be more like a kind Ooh, of noise. Hey, I just thought it would suck them up one at a time and make it an aggressive one noise. Of these robots. <laughs> get a <it> <laughs> When did you get one? I mean, I've got another idea that might help as well. Maybe if Phil's smoke just didn't drop their cigarette butt. Say what? <laughs> it's but part then, of the culture. But then we wouldn't have this cool robot to talk about. So keep an eye out if you're in somewhere with lots of cigarette butts for Vero coming to a city near you sometime Exciting. soon. Exciting. Hydrogen-powered EVs are making a push, and they are pushing into the world of car racing. While it may be a while before you see hydrogen-powered cars at Daytona, Bathurst, or the Monaco Street Circuit, hydrogen-powered car racing is set to make its mark on a circuit in an old, abandoned coal mine in Scotland. EVs racing where we once mined fossil fuels. Quite a juxtaposition, Matt. I do like that. I, when I read that, I went... I like that. I don't have to do it deliberately. I don't know if they said, let's just find anywhere randomly or let's find somewhere that really shows that we're moving ahead here. This is part of a... It kind of makes a statement, doesn't it? It does. It does. Exactly right. This is part of a series, and, and I've got one question which I couldn't find the answer to, which I'll pose in a moment, but Extreme H. Now, we've talked before about Extreme E, and I watch Extreme E from time to time. I happen to flick on the TV on the weekend, and Extreme E's on, I'll watch it. So Extreme E is basically... EVs that are made for off-road, extreme off-road, and they put them on some pretty ridiculous courses and say race, and they are pretty intense, and the, yeah, wow. the people driving them are pretty crazy. Full on. Crazy, yeah, okay. <laughs> I call it what it is, they're crazy. <laughs> and it's really, it's quite popular, and they go around the world and take it to different places, and they do desert races, and they do races so, on rocky so environments. So off-road racing, EV, are there gear changes to happen there? or they, It's just put your foot down and go. <laughs> That's basically it. And, and don't crash into stuff. And they're still heavy and they've got a lot of weight down low. So they are very good at some of these terrains that yeah, right. are maybe going to tip over a normal car or maybe get completely out of control. They do look like they're pretty well in control. Some of the tracks are pretty intense, but Extreme E is very cool. So Extreme H, and the, the question that I haven't been able to find the answer to is – at this moment, it's just a prototype. They've created an Extreme H prototype modelled around the same type of car as an Extreme E. What I can't find is, are they going to race Extreme E and Extreme H together 
in the one race, oh. or are they going to create a completely separate series altogether? I kind of like the idea of putting Extreme E and Extreme H in the race together. If you look at a hydrogen car and how it runs, it's basically an electric car, and the difference is that instead of having a big battery to keep you going, you've got yeah. a tank of hydrogen to keep you going. But what it's doing is it's still driving electricity through electric motors. So it still drives the same. At this stage, they're saying the extreme H vehicles are probably just that little bit faster than an extreme E because they're not as heavy because they don't yeah, need okay. a big battery to keep it yeah, going yeah. for however long each race goes for. So essentially, extreme H in the same race as extreme E may be quite a challenge because these extreme E cars have been developed over a few years and they're going quite well. And then suddenly this other car turns up, which would look very similar, yeah. but another car turns up extreme H and suddenly there's on like Donkey Kong. So. Yeah, well, I wonder if this becomes a bit of a Ford versus Holden, but um, um, it could just mean the sort of the commercial death of one of those models and possibly EVs, you know. Once, once the uh, extreme H starts to look dominant, I wonder whether could or not be. people will just go, well, who's going to waste their money on an EV then? And it could be the big challenge might be they might create some longer races and they try and swap batteries out with the Extreme E or they then uh, refuel the Extreme H. So they could mix it up a little bit along those lines. I can see you becoming an entrepreneur on the racetrack <laughs> and starting your own race series. <laughs> big yeah, prize money there. It does sound good. I mean, obviously the, the crucial part here is producing the hydrogen with green methodology. It's no good yeah. if you've got to burn some type of coal or fossil exactly. fuels yeah. to then produce your hydrogen. And obviously, the fact that they're creating an Extreme H car, they're talking about the fact they're producing their hydrogen in a green method as well. So I like it. And we've talked about it before. If you want to develop any technology, put a trophy at the end of it. So if you <laughs> want to get something better than yeah. an EV, you want to make it or development happen quicker, make it a race Extreme H. If you want to get that hydrogen working better, Suddenly teams competing for a prize at the end of it, they're going to yeah. push that development as far as they possibly can. So I'm keen to see it. They're talking about next year. They're doing the development now. This is a prototype, as I mentioned. They're doing the development now. Next year they're talking about racing it. And again, I want to see whether that's in the same series or a separate series, but I'm looking forward to it. Exciting stuff. For those among us with the first-hand experience of a stroke episode, They'll know all too well about the alarm, the fear, and the uncertainty that comes on without warning. If you're lucky, you'll recognise the symptoms quickly and remember the FAST acronym. Face drooping, arms weakened, speech slurred, and then time. Time to move quickly and call that ambulance. Well, a new brain scanner may be added to the arsenal in the standard ambulance to clearly diagnose strokes in progress and to save long-term debilitation and save lives. Matt, with the portable uh, portability of this thing, it may even become as accessible as defibrillators in the workplace, perhaps. Possibly. I, I thought about the fact that you'd have them in an ambulance in that type well, that of makes sense. vehicle, but maybe it will get to the point where you do put them in a workplace, so hang on the wall somewhere, there's your defib and there's your stroke device. Mm. It's something that is about the size of a backpack, weighs about 10 kilos. The only thing I found interesting was the time to actually detect. So it needs about five minutes to actually do the detection process to see right. whether someone's had a stroke. Now, if you do detect, as you said, there are some signs that you might see, and there's this golden hour. If you can get someone to treatment within that first hour, the long-term prognosis for that is going to be much better rather than, uh, just go and sleep it off for you. It'll be right. We'll, we'll talk to you in a couple of hours' time, and then you realise that, yeah. hold on, we shouldn't have done that. Let's get them to the hospital, and then it can be a bit too late, and there can be some permanent damage. Obviously, here, if the paramedics turn up and they use this device, hold on, we've just detected you've had a stroke, we can start the treatment immediately while we get you in the ambulance and take you to the hospital. Yeah. Much better chance of your long-term being okay. And people do have strokes, and you talk to them a month later, and everything's fine. But again, that's when treatment has been sought pretty quickly and yeah. you've had some sort of process that comes out of it. Obviously, when you get to a hospital, they've got machines now, machines that go bing apparently, but <laughs> machines now. Most expensive machines in the hospital. <laughs> that's right. And they obviously can detect whether someone's had a stroke. But the portability, that's the big thing here, is having the portability. And this is all being developed by an Australian company. It's an asx listed company called M-Vision, E-M-Vision. And essentially, they're talking about this is – what we've got to do, we've got to be able to get better at detection of things that happen because we know the treatment, but sometimes people don't 
take the, the option to get the treatment, uh, the whole range of different things that happen to people, whether it be heart attacks, whether it be strokes, whether it be broken arms sometimes. You know, yeah. I, I know. Well, I've had a, a chat with a couple of colleagues of mine just about vaguing out, people vaguing out. Perhaps they're suffering a mini stroke in doing that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and in which case, um, you know, if this was to happen sort of regularly with a person, you might be able to say, look, we've just got this portable brain scanner. Um, yep. Let's do a quick, quick check of you. That's right. And it's not like it's using any renewable components on there where you've got to replace those so yeah. you can run the test again and again and again and it's not really wearing it out as such it's not like you've got to pour some solution in or use some part of it that oh we've got to replace that and it costs $50 every time we use it yeah. so you could if you just were a bit worried about someone or they did seem a bit vague you could grab it test it no you're okay or okay let's get you to a hospital straight away yeah. I do have another question about defib, and it, it was posed to me recently I was at the airport and we're waiting for our plane and the person with me looked at the defib on the wall and they said do you know how to use a defib?" I went I've got no idea, but <laughs> I know it gives you instructions. I know when you pull it out, yeah. it gives you instructions. But when I was at school, you had to do things like first aid, you had to do chest compressions, mouth to mouth, had to learn, and you were tested on it. You had to yeah. learn how many chest compressions per breath you put in the mouth. Now, I know that's all changed now, and they don't recommend the same methodology of CPR yeah, as it used to be. it changes regularly. It yeah. does. But DFib, maybe there should be something there where every adult and kids at school as well should actually be taught well, how to I'm use a, a teacher in a government school, and we get training on defibrillation. Right. Uh, it was part of our emergency care and CPR training. So perfect. So when, when you pull it off the wall and you open it up, it talks to you, doesn't it? Yes, it, it does. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So if there was a stressful situation, and so take me, for example, I've never had any training on defib. So you pull off the wall, you open it up, and it starts telling you what to do. In a stressful situation where I've got someone laid out on the ground, collapse, presumably their heart's not going and, and it's up to me, yeah. amateur, to save them, is it in such a way that I would understand and be able to take it slow enough to be able to actually do what I need to do to help save this I person? I think it is. Yeah, right. I think it is. But it's also, there's a reason why we do the training with it, yeah. is just so that it is a little bit more um, supported than just listening to a set of instructions for the first time. Yeah. So, yeah, now look, uh, I know that there are other workplaces that also do this training. Um, yep. uh, maybe it's government agencies or whatever. It could be, yeah. Uh, that, that do that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but but I can imagine, you know, uh, if so it's happening with defibrillators, whether or not we're getting brain scanning training as well. <laughs> That's right. That might be the next thing. Maybe when you renew your license, yeah, well, you've got to do a little five-minute video on what actually happens with the defib. So yeah. it's something like that. But anyway, it's interesting. Well, so many we people are, are now seeing stay, uh, what is it, seeing staying alive uh, in their heads now, <laughs> whenever they think staying alive. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to sing it now. Start, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, off the top of slightly, <laughs> but the, the whole concept here is getting better at yeah. picking up when someone's had an issue yeah. oh, without yeah, having so to. so good at it now. Yeah. Yeah, and, and people feel guilty if you say, I think, Maybe there's a problem. Let's get you to the emergency department. You get there, and there's 20 other people there, and you think, oh, I don't want to take up resources here and waste everyone's time. There's yeah. real emergencies here. No, that's right. We'll go back home. So people do feel guilty sometimes about using yeah. those resources up. Now, it's all very well and good to say that crime doesn't pay, but for law enforcement agencies, staying a step ahead of crooks is challenging on the best of days. In an attempt to gain the upper hand, the cops have called in reinforcements. Don't be surprised if you look to the skies now and notice drones hovering overhead. Matt, it seems like a fairly logical move for the police. Some precincts in the US, I believe, have fleets in action already. What are the early reports about drones in the police force? Well, the early reports are good if you're on one side <laughs> and bad if you're on the other Crime side. does not pay. <laughs> <laughs> but there also are some people out there who are concerned about privacy, yeah. about overuse yeah. of drones. Is Are the regulations, and we do talk about this a bit, are the regulations up to date with where technology is up to? And is that a police drone hovering above my yeah. house or is it someone who's just painted a drone that looked like a police drone? That's right. It's got a blue flashing light on top. It must be okay, but maybe it's my neighbour just spying on me. That's a good point, Seems actually. saying, hello, hello, hello. Uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> so there are 1,500, at least 1,500 law enforcement agencies in the US already using drones. Pedestrians, that's a, it's a lot. Uh, that's good. Yeah. yeah, now it's a big country with a lot of people, yeah, but, yeah. but that's not a bad start. 
pedestrians will see drones overhead. And again, it's a good point. I hadn't thought of it, but you see it overhead. My first thought isn't, that must be a police drone. As I'm walking down the street, I see a drone, I go, what kid just got a drone for his yeah. birthday? Or what person's out there spying on what, what people are doing? Yeah. But they're probably not thoroughly tested with regulations at the moment. And we've seen AI being used with facial recognition to identify people. And some states, we've talked about before, can't use that as the only means of interrogation. We think it might be James. Now let's go and find some other evidence that points to James. And so, oh, yes, we've found some other. Now we can go and question James. Because the whole idea of facial recognition is that maybe he gets it wrong and then suddenly... James is being dragged out in handcuffed yeah. when that's the only evidence they've well, we've got. We've talked about that wrongful recognition uh, in the past, yeah, haven't we? Yeah, that's right. So regulations have changed because of that. With drones, I think the same thing will happen. We're getting drones that are better. They've got thermal imagery. They've got ability to break glass. So if they see, a, for example, a child or a pet in a car, a drone has got the ability to actually break glass on that car. So yeah. law enforcement flying around looking for something. Hold on, there's a child in a car. Let's go and smash the window on that to let some air in and make sure they don't overheat. Well, if someone's absconding and running through some people's backyards and leaping fences and stuff like that, must be much easier to chase them with a drone. You think so? Or motorbikes you see on the yeah, movie, so it yeah, must be yeah. true. People get on motorbikes and they go down little alleyways and all the rest of it, and the police cars, of course, can't go down there. But a drone, good luck outrunning yeah. a drone. Yeah. yeah, I think that would be a real challenge. License plate readers they've got on some of the drones now. So there is facial recognition, of course, on there. But all of these things, I just wonder where you're going to get to with the regulations, the New York Police Department's using drones to monitor backyard parties. Again, even if it was a definitely a police drone, even if the police car pulled up out the front and you see the, the police get the drone out and take off and hover over your party, uh, I just don't know. I'd sit there cooking yeah. the barbecue. Is he judging how I'm cooking this steak now? Is that, <laughs> am I going to be in trouble because I've cooked it too long on one side or I've double flipped or something terrible there? Have I committed some crime? But I think we're just going to see them. I think the convenience yeah. factor the ability for the police to get to locations that they couldn't easily get to in other ways. And you've got the camera on there. So it's recording all this footage, sending it back to someone, even in a police chase. It would be easy to track, send back to a central office, the the police station, for example, and say, yep, they're going down this way. I think if you go around to the next corner, you'll be able to cut them off coming straight through there. Just those sort of things make sense. But privacy advocates are very, very concerned. Mm. And I was actually thinking very concerned about the police side of it, but I think your point's more valid. Very concerned about other people pretending to be police. I reckon you can tell the difference between a a police drone and a non-police drone. If it's coming out of a Krispy Kreme donut store, (laughs) then it's probably Definitely a police one? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) If it's got some pink icing, sort of you can detect that uh, (laughs) sort of dripping off it, that's probably... Police drone. <laughs> anyway, not that we're stereotyping all police. There. <laughs> no, I think that's, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just going to be. Um, it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be different. Very different. So I don't know whether you're stereotyping there of police is because of the Simpsons or the Simpsons is reflective of society. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as this episode goes to air, the Paris Olympics have come to a close and it's been another triumph for Australian sport. Go us. A chance for our relatively small nation to stick it to the big boys on the global stage. But with all the hubbub holding our attention in France, did you know just across the channel in the UK, the International Mathematical Olympiad had also drawn the best and brightest from all around the globe? And... In what can only be described as an arm wrestle, or perhaps dare I say a brain wrestle, for the first time in history, AI has taken a place on the podium with a silver medal. Matt, AI is no stranger to controversy. It's caused a real stir in the city of Bath this July. Talk us through the highs and the lows at the International Mathematical Olympiad. So why doesn't... Or why don't we have the IMO at the Olympics? Why is the <laughs> IMO only focused on physical sports? Why not some... I'm going to imagine that the IMO is not a spectator kind of event, <laughs> is it? You, you know? so? Look, you he's know. taking out the pencil. He, he's scribbling. Oh, he's gone for that equation. Well, yeah. look at that. <laughs> look at him scribbling. Scribbling furiously. Mind you, there are some sports... You know, if AI's coming into it, it's just going to be, ah, oh, AI spat out an answer. <laughs> Well done, That's AI. Right. 
<laughs> so you'd, Very you'd wanna, hard to commentate. You'd want to build it up a bit. Uh, we're waiting. We're waiting for the answer. And AI's already got the answer, but yeah, we're still waiting. Right. So it's fascinating where we're headed with AI. And I try not to talk about AI too much, but it just seems to be... Well, I don't think you can these days. You can't talk about the future and technology without talking about AI. I, th- I think it's that's part of the problem. Everything. It just seems omnipresent at the moment. So we have the International Mathematical Olympiad, as you've said, and lots of competition from lots of clever mathematicians. And the idea here is they give them difficult problems to solve and then they go away, as you say, and maybe not great spectator sport, but <laughs> try and solve those problems. So that's fantastic. And we've had computers. We've had that competition or computers in the competition before, but they don't do very well at it. Computers yeah. are great at remembering a formula yeah. and applying some basic concepts to that formula to answer if you've got the, the question there. But when it's about... Thinking when it's about solving challenging mathematical yeah, problems. Deeper analysis, yeah. Yeah, analysis and then using the information you have to solve the problem. That's where I hope, James, I hope still <laughs> that humans still have the ability to think, to create the problem rather than just it goes step one to step two to step three. Computers are great at that. Yeah. But when it's got to be decisions and yeah. make some sort of leap or be creative i think that's where yeah. humans have got it until maybe now so in the latest competition well, as you say, silver medal is only one step away isn't it only one step away so this is the first time ai has competed many times before but it hasn't managed to make it onto the podium before it has made it onto the podium now as you say with a silver medal so it's called this is deep minds alpha proof AI, so it's got a complicated name, as you'd expect from it. And there were a range of participants. And and what's interesting is it's not like the Olympics when you get a gold medal if you win. They gave out 58 gold medals. Right. Because you've got a threshold. If you get above a certain level, it's like a qualifying level. So you win a gold medal if you get above the threshold. So 58 people won gold medals in the one competition. So it's not quite like the Olympics, but here in this particular competition, so 58 participants got the threshold, passed the threshold to win a gold medal. 123 won silver medal. So it's not like it got outright second, but it still met the threshold to get a silver medal. And I do start to wonder then, you've got the Millennium Prize, the seven. I think there's seven problems, aren't there, in the Millennium Prize. There's a, a million dollars on offer. No, you're telling me. Right. So there's, there's this thing I vaguely remember called the Millennium Prize. And they've posed in that seven mathematical problems that are abstract, difficult, maybe unsolvable, maybe not. But the Millennium Prize is basically if you can solve one of these seven Millennium Prizes, you've got a million bucks. So go for it. Knock yourself out. But obviously... They're pretty difficult, and mathematicians around the world have probably had a bit of a crack at them with a million bucks on offer, but maybe that's where something like alpha-proof AI or the next version of it, maybe beta-proof AI, AI, is going to get to the stage where it solves one of these seven Millennium Prize problems there. I can't tell you what the... And then who collects the cash? (laughs) Well, that's a good question. The AI says, it's mine, it's mine, stay away. (laughs) But I... And and maybe go and Google If someone steps in and collects the cash on behalf of AI, does AI then get upset and start to turn on us like Hal did in um, 2001 Space Odyssey? Quite possibly. Give AI the prize. This will be the end of it. Yeah, just just let it have the money. Hand it over. (laughs) It may have no use for the money, but let it have the money. So go and look them up. I'm sure it's called the Millennium Prize. Go and look up the seven ones there if if you're listening interested and if you've got nothing to do on the weekend just try and knock one of those solutions out and see you go for the million bucks or maybe better create an AI that will go and knock one of those out so (laughs) it's getting better at solving problems James which I think is a good and maybe bad thing as well all at the same time (laughs) of course a major concern for the broad scale shift to, to current battery technology has been the finite lifespan of lithium batteries Well, it may not surprise you that research teams around the globe have been racing to remedy this problem. And some clever cookies at Rice University in Texas have cracked the conundrum wide open and developed a solution for recycling lithium batteries with astounding success. Matt, this is a significant step towards battery tech. I do get a little bit frustrated when I read various things, and I don't read a lot of them, I must admit, but things on social media where they say, well, it's no good using batteries because you'll just be burying all these batteries in a few years' time. Yeah. And I do think, well, do you think anyone's out there 
trying to solve the problem. Do you think anyone's out there saying, hold on, we'll have lots of batteries. I reckon there's a market for recycling those. <laughs> I reckon there's someone out there that's probably going to say, I can solve this yeah, problem. These arguments are saying, you know, that the technology's reached its ceiling and it cannot possibly go any further. Yeah, after, yeah. after just a few years being around. Yeah. So you're right. Researchers at Rice University have come up with a new method where they think, or their, their tests have shown so far, they can get about 98% recovery of the metals in the battery. percent So it's not too bad. Now, when you think about it, if I've got the choice, I need to make a battery for my manufacturing process, for my car, whatever I'm doing, and I can get someone who mines the metals that I need and I'll pay them X dollars per tonne for the, the things that I need. Or there's some other company over here who does recycling of those and I'll pay Y dollars per tonne. I might choose to pay the Y if it's a little bit higher, but if it's similar, I definitely would. But it's probably going to get to the stage where the recycling is going to be cheap because mining stuff is mm. an expensive process. Yeah. There's a whole range of things that have to happen to get to the stage where you pull that metal out of the mining process. So, Recycling is definitely going to be a valid solution, but also we're probably going to run out of stuff to dig up, whatever we dig up, whatever things yeah, we're doing. That's right. The earth has only got so many things to give us, to give up out of its soil, so it's you're going to run out. So you need to be able to have some way recycling. What this does that's a bit different is it does a, a fast heating, a very um, a flash heating, if you like, up to 2,500 Kelvin, so basically... What's that, Kelvin 273.15, so about 2,226 degrees Celsius, thereabouts. So yeah, hot, right. basically. Yeah, 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 too yeah, hot well. to put your finger on, lick your finger and to test how hot it is. <laughs> so that seems to be part of the secret here. Other recycling has used things where they've used some sort of chemical solutions, heat and chemical solutions. This is using no chemicals, just using heat and then some processes. Wow. And they're probably not revealing all the processes they're using, but <laughs> using some processes to basically rapidly heat the battery, pull these metals out, and then hand them over but to be... 98%. Mm. I mean, you said that's pretty good. I mean, that's that's fantastic. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is. So you're not losing much each time. So you then go and put that back into service. That battery might use, be used yeah. for the next seven years. It's down to the point where you say, okay, I'm not getting enough of the battery, the initial storage capacity of the battery. So let's put it back in and you get it back again, 98%. So yeah, wow. you're going pretty well. There'll still be a lot of mining for many years to come to deliver all the battery solutions we need. But at some point, you're going to get to the point where these sort of recycling solutions are going to be the predominant way that manufacturers get the, the materials they need, I think, anyway. It's getting harder and harder to fill some jobs these days. Thankless, mundane tasks that a growing number of people think are below them and just don't want to do. Well, Matt, for those who feared that AI was going to take over and steal our jobs, I guess they were right. But is anybody really going to be phased if AI is doing all that boring admin stuff? I think AI is only going to steal the jobs that aren't being filled. I think that's part yeah. of the problem we have employees in Australia and a whole range of jobs at the moment and across the world. But when I talk to employers in various locations in Australia, they do talk about the fact they're struggling to get employees for certain things. And many people see themselves as being above doing some of the basic yeah. mundane tasks. Yeah. So there are companies now, and when we see the fact that we're going to lose some of these jobs and, oh, no, what will those people do? We need people employed in the businesses that are going to create the solutions for these other jobs that are going to be solved. So you're going to transfer the jobs that are out there. They may re transfer at a reduced rate, but there are going to be other jobs available. So you've got a couple of companies now. Safety Culture is one, an Australian startup, and they've got an AI agent named Bosch. It started work in January. It's done its six-month probation. So fine, happy to keep employing Bosch now as, <laughs> as the AI agent. And it can do things like filter spam, Go through your email and just pull out the spam and say, that looks like spam. Don't waste your time deleting that. I'm going to do it for you. It can manage your calendar. It oh, can, I need this thing. <laughs> it can look at your emails and it can pick up that this person's asking you for an appointment. Let's go and look in your calendar. Looks like you're free then. Yes, I can schedule that appointment into your calendar and then go and do it. I schedule some virtual meetings so you can do your, your Zoom or your Teams calls, for example. Manage online customer inquiries. Hmm, gets a bit scary. I, I just feel like I'd want to read that before yeah. I look at it. One thing I do love, and I've actually used this myself, sometimes if I'm reading a, a large corporate report for an organization just to get a feel for that business, 
it takes some time to go through and read it. And if I want to summarize some bits of it to show someone else, I'll pull out some certain bits and then give that to someone else. But these tools are using the technology within AI to read large corporate reports and then give you the basically summary, the one page summary, the the TLDK, the too long. <laughs> no, did I get that right? Too long. Didn't read TLDR, sorry, not TLDK. You're telling the story. Yeah. This is new <laughs> T- one on me. T- yeah. TLDR, so the too long didn't read. So rather than go through and decide I didn't read it, here's the summary version of that. Yeah. So looking at some of those ways that you can just make your day-to-day life a bit easier. You've also got Atlassian, who's got a product called Rovo, and it's the same sort of thing. It can help with AI, sorry, social media posts. So if you're thinking, oh, I've got this thing that just happened, here's the media release from it or here's the information about it, I've got to go and write a very short, brief social media post. No, no, just give it to your agent. It'll take that information and create the social media post for you. you Um, So again, we're going to see more and more of these. Relevance AI is one that at the moment already they've got 40,000 AI agents out there. I'm just a bit sceptical now when I send an email off to a company and I get a very personal response from a person I'm just going to be sceptical now. That's, did that, that's right. Did that really come from a person? It sounded Someone's so Someone's shirking thorough. their job. <laughs> that's right. Someone's been very clever. It's supposedly a Bill Gates quote, and I'm sure it's not. But the, the quote is that if you want something done, give it to the laziest person you know because they'll work out the quickest and easiest quickest way to get it done. Yeah, right. <laughs> so maybe that guy shirking his job is just employed an AI agent and he's sitting back there <laughs> drinking a few beers and taking it easy. <laughs> Now, this next story has my head spinning. In order to train AI, very large amounts of data are required, right? But if humans are doing the training, that input is, well, it's all quite manageable. But we know that AI can manage enormous amounts of data more quickly than humans can and much more efficiently. But then if AI tries to train AI, there is so much data being processed so quickly It all falls over in a spectacular mess with ones and zeros spread all over the floor. Matt, have I got my facts right? (laughs) You have, and it does. It feels to me like the old photocopier we used to have. I suppose there's still photocopies out there. I don't know how many people use photocopies anymore, but you've got a photocopier, and someone photocopies something, and they give that copy to you. And then they need some time later to give that copy to someone else, so they photocopy it and give it to someone else. And four or five, maybe ten versions later, you're having trouble reading the photocopy of the photocopy (laughs) of the photocopy. So it does deteriorate in quality. Of course, one thing that's fantastic when you start talking about transferring digital files, and we're talking about audio, for example, if you've got digital audio, then you know that the quality of that stays the same each time it's transferred. When you've got AI, there were some suggestions by Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of, of Meta, where he said that with all these systems, AI systems that are being trained up, maybe we should use some of the output from some older AI systems to train up the new AI systems. And that is where you will get a spectacular fail because they've tried that. They've actually done this visual image, all these ones and zeros just (laughs) all over the floor. And it's, oh, I've got to clean that up now. (laughs) You would have to clean it up. It took about nine iterations of training before what you finally get out is gibberish, complete (laughs) and utter gibberish. So so they've tried it. Now, the challenge is going to be, as AI still trains itself on data that's available out there on the internet, how does it know which parts of that data are human-created and which parts are AI-created? Because as it ingests all this data, if it ingests enough AI-generated data, you'll start to get it, maybe not through nine iterations, maybe through 20 iterations, 30 iterations, as it gets more data from out there on the internet, and some of that data is AI created, suddenly you'll go, what's it saying here? Yeah, it makes no yeah, sense right. at all. So it's almost like being a, a cannibal. It's eating its own, and it's just not, <laughs> not looking good after it's eating its own. Uh, there are yeah. some discussions about maybe having some watermarking. It's, you can watermark photos, and you can say on those photos, this is generated by AI. Watermarking text is a bit more difficult. Every text that was created, you could put something at the beginning of that to say this is AI generated, but someone could delete that as well. Mm. AI could delete that. So it, it is a bit scary. There is some concern, and I, and I read this quote from one of the gentlemen involved in this testing that said, without the proper safeguards, the internet 
could be flooded with low quality generated content. I'm thinking, <laughs> well, isn't that what we've got now? Yeah, <laughs> Lots right. Lots of low quality generated it's, it's content. It's just about where you stand and sit, isn't it? <laughs> it is exactly right. So I, I'm intrigued to see how we'll go as we continue to try and train AI. On to serious things now. For the elderly, a simple fall in the home can come with extremely serious consequences. Imagine then having to weigh up the risks in getting up in the night just to go to the toilet. A seemingly simple task, but potentially fraught with peril if a bed corner is misjudged or an obstacle is forgotten. Thanks to some clever people, a series of smart lamps have been developed, designed to save elderly people from, well, who are at their most vulnerable, Matt. 70%, James, 70% of old adults, and I'm not sure what the definition of an older adult is, but presumably older than you and I, hopefully. Well, yeah, hopefully. 70% of older adults fall at least once a year. Now, sometimes, and I've had this happen to people that I've known, you have a fall, you break a hip, you go into hospital, you don't come out again. It seems to be that when you get to that point where you damage yourself in that way, that sometimes that's the beginning of a fairly rapid end. Mm. So if you can prevent that, and maybe one way of preventing that is, again, as you say, getting up in the middle of the night, going to the toilet and being able to see where you're going. Now, you might think, turn the light on, and that's easy, but sometimes the light switch isn't nearby, or the light's a bit too bright in the middle of the night, so you just get up and fumble your way around. Or you just forget to turn on the light. That's right. I know where the toilet is, but you forgot that you left a pair of shoes on the ground between you and the toilet, and then that's where you trip over. So these Nobi lamps turn on automatically getting in and out of bed. Now, it's funny, I've got lots of sensors around my house, going to the bathroom, toilet, etc., And I have actually thought about whether I should put sensors in the bedroom so that you walk in, the light comes on, and you walk out, and 30 seconds later it goes off. But then I thought, in the middle of the night, I might move around a bit. Is that going to be enough to trigger it? So I haven't worried about doing it, because I am, I don't know if I'm a restless sleeper, but I'm worried that... Find out just how restless you are. (laughs) That's right, that's right. And I don't want to have that in the middle of the night. So these are designed so that they're not sensitive enough, that they'll be triggered by someone being restless in the middle of the night. But when they get up, as soon as they get up, so again, it's looking for particular actions. As soon as they get up, then it'll turn the lights on. But turn the lights on low, so it's enough light to see Uh. to get to the toilet without having enough light to see and be blinded by it and, and not be able to see where you're going anyway. The other problem with getting a bright light in the middle of the night is that it wakes you up too. It takes Completely. you out of that, yeah, yeah, that's that right. sleep so, cycle. So you, you're trying to keep it low to keep that in yeah, sort of normal sleep cycle. Fall detection. So if you do fall, a trigger goes off to let someone know. You've got pre-programmed oh, wow. details in there to let people know that something's happening. Um, notifications on getting in and out of bed. If you're in a nursing home, for example, when you get up, not only does it trigger the light, but triggers a notification to the nursing station to say, Mary's just getting up. So just be aware, or you might just want to go down and have a bit of a check on the room to make sure Mary's okay. So again, you get this more information coming through. If you do end up on the ground, you've got two-way communication, so you can say, help, I'm on the ground. So we've talked about it before, that you've got the stick figures. We've done that in a previous podcast. So this actually uses that technology where it'll show images of an unidentifiable stick figure for emergency assessment to say something's happened and here's someone laying on the ground so it, it doesn't embarrass that person as such. So I think it's a good idea. And again, it just shows us that we are keeping people alive longer, healthier longer, using technology to do that, and that'll keep developing with a whole range of different products. We do have a lifespan now that's almost double what it was about 120 years ago, and a lot of that is medicine, but some of that is technology as well. Yeah, very encouraging. And with that, the flags are being lowered and the covers are being brought out and unrolled. Anyone caught standing still for too long here is likely to be trapped under a tarp for a week or so. So we better get moving, Matt. Absolutely. Thanks for another cracking tech talk. Extreme H. I'm going to do some more research on Extreme H. I'm keen to see in the same race, but I just (laughs) want to see whether they're going to have a separate series or not. I'll check that out a bit more. Well, I'm off to practice my math so I can stay one step ahead of AI, Um, (laughs) like it's a computer game or something. We need to assert ourselves as a human race in the field of mathematics. Thanks for tuning in to Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Tech Talk is a podcast created by the people for the people with a focus on healthy and prosperous futures for all. Because that's just how we roll. I'm your host, James Eddy, and I'll be back in a week or so, hopefully with a much less sexy voice than what I've got today when uh, I've um, managed to shake this, um, well, sub-flu that I've got. We hope you'll uh, be back to fulfil your end of the bargain as well. Until then, take care and have a lovely week.